Hello, my name is Hello, my name is Tia Yang. I am with Work and Burke, and you are in the How to Pay for College Scholarship Night. Um, before I proceed, we will pass it over to our interpreters to give some instructions. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Patty and uh, Jackie. We're going to be the interpreters for tonight's uh, call. We come from Sanson Lea Language Justice Cooperate. We, this is a bilingual call, so we're going to do a really brief presentation about what that means um, and what we need the participants to do to be part of the bilingual space. And I will be doing this intro in Spanish and English. And then um, once we do that, the, the call will start be bilingual, and then you can just select, and we will have uh, simultaneous interpretation. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Patti, mi compañera es Jackie. Vamos a estar interpretando la llamada de hoy de inglés a español y de español a inglés. Esta llamada es bilingüe, entonces les vamos a explicar cómo va a funcionar la interpretación en la llamada. Les voy a hacer esta presentación en inglés y en español y eh, a partir de después de la presentación la llamada pasará a ser eh, interpretada simultáneamente. Uh, to access the interpretation, if you are in your computer, you will see that little glove at the bottom of the Zoom call that says interpretation. And once you click on it, you will see that says Spanish or English or off. If you are bilingual, you can leave it in off. Otherwise, if you're monolingual English speaker or monolingual Spanish speaker, we ask you to select the language that you want to participate and listen to the call in. Uh, so if you are an English speaker, you will select English and Spanish speakers like Spanish. If you are on a phone or iPad, Ima, you will have to find it under the three dots that says more, and then it will say language interpretation, um, and then click, once again, click your selected language, and then click done. Entonces, para acceder a la interpretación, si estás en la computadora, vas a ver como un globito que pone interpretación y tienes tres opciones, apagado, inglés y español. Si eres bilingüe, puedes dejarle la opción de apagado, pero si eh, prefieres eh, como el idioma principal el inglés o el español, tienes que elegir ese idioma. Por ejemplo, si eres monolingüe eh, hablante de inglés, seleccionas eh, inglés y si eres de español, seleccionas español. Si estás en un teléfono inteligente o iPad, eh, la opción se verá dentro de los tres puntitos que pone más, interpretación de idiomas, y una vez más seleccionas el idioma que prefieres escuchar y participar en esta llamada y seleccionas terminar. How can we be in language justice practice together? Entonces vamos a explicar cómo podemos practicar la justicia del lenguaje Juntex. We ask you to mute your phone if you're not speaking. Uh, that will help us have a clear uh, uh, sound as we interpret. Les pedimos que silencie el micrófono si no estás eh, hablando, mantener tu micrófono apagado cuando no estás participando en la llamada nos ayudará a tener un sonido más nítido y claro. We only have one mic to interpret, so we just ask you to speak one at a time. We don't want to choose who to interpret for. Uh, Zoom helps with that, but just as a reminder, uh, to not talk over each other. Uh, entonces, solo tenemos un micrófono. No queremos elegir a quién interpretamos. Entonces, al que Zoom nos ayuda con esto, les recordamos que solo hablen una persona a la vez. Speak loud and clear, speak up. Um, hablen en voz alta, fuerte y claro. If you have a mic, just speak, you know, as clear to the mic as you can. Si tienes un micrófono, habla tan claro el micrófono como puedas. Oops. And, oh. and if you guys have any, oh, there we go. Uh, slow down, speak a moderate pace. Hable despacio, un ritmo moderado, más lento. We, as we say, we're interpreting live simultaneously. Um, so just remember that as you're doing your presentation or if you're asking questions to just as low um, the way you talk a little bit for us to give us some time to catch up. Entonces habla un poquito más despacio, un ritmo más moderado. Estamos interpretando simultáneamente. Entonces recuerden que, que lo estamos haciendo en directo y que hablen un poquito más despacio si, si se notan que están hablando muy rápido. And take a breath after each sentence, pause after asking a question or when there is a switch in speakers, um, just because we all need it, but also sometimes we forget because we're trying to catch up with everything or share as much as we can. So just to remember to just take a breath. 
y respiren después de cada frase, pausa de hacer una pregunta o cuando cambie la persona que está participando. Hay veces que hablamos muy rápido porque nos interesa mucho lo que estamos hablando y nos olvidamos de tomar un segundo para respirar. If you have any issues with interpretation, please let us know. Uh, write it on the chat. You can write, write it to the interpreters um, and we will help you as soon as we can. Si tienes algún problema con la interpretación, déjanos saber inmediatamente. Nos puedes escribir un mensaje por el chat y te ayudaremos tan pronto como podamos. So with that being said, my uh, co-interpret Jackie should be now um, checking the channels and starting the interpretation in in, in, in Spanish, as I'm speaking in English right now. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Tia and to go from here. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patty and Jackie, for being here with us. Again, welcome. My name is Tia Yang. I am the program coordinator for Work in Burke. Um, and you are attending the How to Pay for College Scholarship Night event. It is an annual event that we host every year for the FAFSA, opens on October 1st. Um, before we get into any housekeeping items, I want to thank the many partners who have worked with us to make this happen. Um, we have some very dedicated folks at Burke County Public Schools, Gear Up, College Foundation of North Carolina, um, all of the organizations in the communities that offer scholarship for our students. Thank you all. So now I will be um, giving you a few housekeeping items um, to take note of, and it will also be in the chat. Make sure you choose your language options. If you have issues choosing your language option, um, type it in the chat and our interpreters will help you. Um, this Zoom will also be recorded and released so you can go back to review anything that you've missed. Put your questions, your financial aid FAFSA questions in the chat box. We do have wonderful financial aid experts who will be manning the chat box and answering your questions. We will also have time for a Q&A session with Skip to address some of these questions. We have a very tight agenda um, so I will move us along. It's a, it's a one and a half hour Zoom call. So I will make sure we're on time. Um, if your questions are unanswered, you can send them to skip at skip.watts at cfi.org. That will also be in the chat. So let me give you a brief overview of our agenda. We will start with Skip's presentation followed by a Q&A session. You'll learn about upcoming lab sessions from our partners, Gear Up, and then you will hear from three scholarship providers. Finally, we will wrap up with more information about where to access local scholarships. And now we will transition over to Skip. Let us welcome our dear friend, College Foundation of North Carolina representative, Skip Watts. Skip has partnered with us for several years now to provide vital FAFSA and financial aid information to our students. Skip, thank you for your continued partnership. And again, please put your questions for Skip in the chat box. Take it away. Great, thank you so much, Tia. I really appreciate that introduction. Hello, families in Burke County. We're gonna cover a lot of information in 20 minutes. I want to be as cognizant as possible of your time. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the FAFSA. That's the free application for federal student aid. And that's something I recommend all families in Burke County consider doing before their high school senior completes their senior year. In fact, I recommend you do it as soon as next month in October. Now, moving forward, tonight we're gonna to be talking about a bunch of different topics. To start with, we'll talk about the College Cost of Attendance, or COA, in the financial aid world. Cost of attendance includes every cost you'll experience at the college level, and I'll discuss those in a few minutes. I'll be talking a lot about different types of financial aid. Financial aid includes grants and scholarships, which are free dollars to help you pay for college, but it also includes student loans, and possible employment, like a work study job or possibly a job off campus. I want students 
to maximize grant and scholarship attainment and minimize student loan indebtedness. The FAFSA or the free application for federal student aid is how we get this process started. And one thing I would like to emphasize is this process, process should always be free. You don't wanna pay anybody to help you complete the FAFSA. If you need assistance, there are plenty of outreach organizations across the state and in Burke County as well, offering assistance in completing the FAFSA. I'll be talking about federal, state, and institutional scholarship and aid programs. I'll be talking a little bit about the Residency Determination Service, which is a program that's unique to North Carolina. I'll talk a little bit about scholarship resources and I'll leave the rest of the experts within our panel. And I'll talk briefly about some resources that high school seniors can take advantage of on cfnc.org. Now, college costs include all of the following bulleted points. Tuition is the first and maybe the, the most important part of your college costs, but you also have to pay required fees. Those required fees could be uh, the use of the infirmary at the university you're at, or they could also be the use of the uh, football field if you wanted to watch a football game. All of those required fees you have to pay, so you have to factor those into the cost of attendance or COA in financial aid speak. You may also have to pay room and board if you're moving away from home to a, a university town or, or to a college that's, that's not within the Burke County region. And then you also have some indirect costs like books and supplies. Books and supplies, those costs can vary from school to school, but we have to take them into consideration as well as transportation, personal and miscellaneous expenses, and also loan fees. Students, if you complete the FAFSA, you will be made eligible for federal direct student loans. Those student loans will be on your name. I encourage students to be as conservative as possible when borrowing from any entity, including the federal government. So only borrow what you need and never borrow more than your first year's proposed salary. Now, a couple more terms that I wanna get out of the way before we move forward. Gift aid, that's grants and scholarships in the financial aid world. That's what we have to work to maximize during our senior year. We also have self-help. Self-help includes employment and student loans. Students, again, if you're gonna borrow to help pay for your college experience, you want to be extremely conservative because student loans have to be repaid. You can't default from federal loans through a bankruptcy process. Merit-based aid, well, that's a scholarship that's based on something that makes you special. That could be your ethnicity, your race, your gender, your academic performance, your musical inclination, et cetera. Need-based aid is based on a family completing the FAFSA and it's dependent on the student's score within that process. The lower a student's score on the FAFSA, which is called an expected family contribution, the more need-based aid that a student is eligible for at the federal, state, and potentially institutional level. <coughs> now, the basic principle of financial aid is just below. If we take that cost of attendance, or COA, in the financial aid world, and we subtract it from your score on the FAFSA, which is again, your expected family contribution. Whatever is left over is what the student and family has to fill with either grants and scholarships, potentially with student loans, or maybe they have to pay out of pocket. I would prefer that students meet that need with grant and scholarship dollars. And that requires the students start thinking proactively now moving forward about finding ways to help supplement those college costs. This process in my mind starts with the FAFSA or the free application for federal student aid. You can access the FAFSA your senior year starting in October by going to fafsa.gov. I would encourage families to get their electronic signature for signing the FAFSA before starting that process in October. In fact, if you would like to get that electronic signature or FSA ID, you can get that tonight by going to fsaid.ed.gov. I should also mention that the student will have an FSA ID in order to sign their FAFSA electronically, but also the parents or parent will have one FSA ID. So there will be two for each family in effort to sign and complete the FAFSA process. 
Again, the FAFSA starts or opens in October. I would encourage families to consider completing that in October or November because financial aid is first come first serve, especially at the state level. Many state opportunities will be spent by the turn of the year. You can complete the FAFSA on your phone or your computer or your PC. Just make sure you're in a secure wireless environment because you will be putting some personal identifiable information into the form. Also, I want you to meet your college's deadlines. Every college has a priority deadline for FAFSA filers. Students, it's on you to figure out what that deadline is, identify it, and adhere to it, okay? So if you haven't already started researching colleges, you might want to get on that as well as scholarships starting as soon as possible. You don't want to wait until you're admitted to a university or community college to complete the FAFSA. Go ahead and complete the FAFSA in October or November, and um, if you choose, you can complete your college applications within that timeline as well. But don't wait until you're admitted to a school to complete the FAFSA. You may wait your way out of some aid opportunities. Students, you can add 10 colleges to your electronic FAFSA. All of those 10 colleges will receive results from you completing the FAFSA. I recommend you put every college you're potentially interested in on that list. It's a simple click and drag uh, measure that you very, are, very well are familiar with. Uh, within a internet process. This FAFSA is a yearly process. So every year you're gonna have to do the FAFSA if you want to be eligible for state, federal, and possibly institutional aid. Now, most students in attendance, I would imagine, are dependent, which means they will be filing the 2022-23 FAFSA with their parents. Dependent students answer no to all the questions I have below. Dependent students were not born before January 1st, 1999. They're not married. They're not working on a graduate degree. They don't have children or dependents of their own. They're not in the military, nor are they a veteran of any branch of the armed services. Dependent students have not been awarded the court. They have not been an emancipated minor, emancipated minor, excuse me. Dependent students are not under legal guardianship, and dependent students have not been at risk of homelessness as defined by the McKinney-Vento Act. Students, if perhaps you could have answered yes to any of those bolded points on the slide behind, you may be able to complete the FAFSA independently. Please feel free to reach out to me in the chat if you want to inquire further. Now for FAFSA-related purposes, parents are biological or adoptive parents. In those situations, they're gonna file with their student as a married couple. Biological or adoptive parents who aren't married to each other but living in the same home are gonna act as if they're married for FAFSA-related purposes and complete the FAFSA together with their student. A single parent who's widowed or never married can complete that FAFSA with their student. And in a divorced household, the student is gonna file their FAFSA with the parent whom they live with most. So students, if you're living with your mom most of the time, file the FAFSA with your mom. It's called the 51% rule in the financial aid world. If you're living with mom 51% of the time, use her tax information to complete the FAFSA. And while I'm on that note, parents, we're gonna use our 2020 tax information to complete the 2022-23 FAFSA. Now, uh, there has been a lot of economic turbulence associated with this COVID virus, and unfortunately, it has impacted some families' ability to pay for college. If a family is completing the 2022-23 FAFSA, they are again going to use their 2020 taxes. After completing the FAFSA, that won't reflect what happened potentially over the 2021 calendar year. So if students, a parent has lost their job or there's been some undue medical expenses or, or unfortunately there's been a death in the family and that's gonna impact your ability to pay for school, it's contingent on you to reach out to the college and advocate for yourself and ask for a professional judgment because of that special circumstance. Again, that happens if there's been a dramatic change in income from 2020 to 2021. Uh, again, as I've mentioned, parents and students were using our 2020 taxes to complete the FAFSA. 
we're doing again the 2022-23 FAFSA, which is what will start in August for the August school year. Uh, we're going to be using uh, our tax information from those years, which will include adjusted gross income, earnings from work, tax liability, and untaxed income. We will use current account balances for our cash savings and checking accounts, any real estate investments we hold outside of our residential property. Uh, we will use current information if parents, you own a business that employs more than 100 people. And we will use current information about investment farms, which are farms that are off a parent's residential property. Parents note, no information about your residential property will be factored into the FAFSA, nor will any retirement information go against you when completing the FAFSA. Uh, the IRS data retrieval tool is a tool that was designed by the federal government to make completion of the FAFSA easier and less complicated and, and less timely. It's essentially a way where the IRS auto-populates financial information into the student's FAFSA. You can see here in this slide that the parent tax filing status page is where a family can link over to the IRS. And again, the IRS will auto-populate a lot of the uh, technical parts of the financial section of the FAFSA. I strongly encourage students and families to use this IRS data retrieval tool because again, it makes it easier to complete the process. It's time efficient. And more importantly, if you use it, you're less likely to be verified or audited by the federal government or your college. Once the FAFSA is completed, the student will receive a confirmation page. It may be helpful for students to make note of their data release number. Occasionally that can be useful at the financial aid office level. So I recommend a student make note of that and also make note of their expected family contribution. The lower a student's expected family contribution, the more grant eligibility they can take advantage of. If a family has a zero EFC, they're automatically eligible, for example, for a Pell Grant upwards of $6,000. On top of the federal Pell Grant, students that complete the FAFSA and show need may be eligible for the federal, federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant and the federal work study. Federal work study is where students can actually work on a college campus and be paid through a federal program. This is a wonderful opportunity for students to develop a resume, responsibility, and a network for postgraduate opportunities. Students who complete the FAFSA are also eligible for federal direct loans. There are two types that students can take advantage of, the first of which is the subsidized Stafford loan. That's a need-based program that's designed to help students that have low expected family contributions. It's at a very low interest rate at 3.73%, and it does not accrue interest while the student is in college. The other option that a student is made eligible for, in fact, every student that completes the FAFSA is made eligible for, is the unsubsidized Stafford loan. The unsubsidized Stafford loan is at the same interest rate. However, it does accrue interest from the data dispersal. I recommend that students only borrow what they need in order to pay for college-related expenses. Do not use federal direct loan dollars for anything outside of that realm. There are parent loans as well, and there are graduate student loans, um, but the interest rate is dramatically higher. So parents, at some point we have to retire. Please be uh, keep that in the back of your mind. The North Carolina state programs are below. Uh, students that show need by completing the FAFSA are eligible potentially for the UNC need-based grant. That goes to students attending one of the 16 public institutions or public universities in North Carolina. The North Carolina Community College Grant is the same, but designed for students that attend a community college. The North Carolina Need-Based Scholarship is for students that show need on the FAFSA and are attending a private university, perhaps like Lenore Ryan. And then the North Carolina Education Lottery Scholarship is a program designed to help middle-income families who have completed the FAFSA pay for college. Some additional state programs include NC Reach, which is designed to help foster youth pay for college, the Golden Leaf Program, which is designed to help students that come from economically depressed 
or tobacco oriented economies pay for college. Uh, we also have the Fells program down at the bottom, which is a program that's near and dear to my heart because it helps educators or future educators and future healthcare providers pay for college. Please note, it's not a true scholarship or a loan. It's designed by the state to meet critical needs areas. The state really needs more teachers and healthcare providers. If you're willing to participate in one of those career fields, the state will help you pay for college under the assumption you work within North Carolina for each year you received funding. If you do not, it turns into a loan at the date of dispersal. Uh, residency Determination Service. That is a program that's unique to North Carolina, and it's essentially the state's effort to guarantee everyone receiving tuition discounts is in fact a state resident. So students, this is my next challenge. After you get your FSA ID, I would prefer that you go ahead and complete the residency process by going to ncresidency.org. It should take about 15 to 30 minutes to complete this, and it will benefit you by completing it before you start your college applications. Once you've completed RDS, please make note of your residency certification number which will uh, be required in each North Carolina college or community college application. Once you've completed this process and you've had your FAFSA electronically sent to the college you want to attend and the college has admitted you, you will then be awarded a financial aid notice or financial award, it depends on the school you're attending as to what that terminology is. That award will uh, consist of your expected family contributions and disclaimers about your aid. Those disclaimers will come to the student's email. So students, if you're not already checking your email regularly, Skip, I think we lost you. Was it us? complete and terms and conditions that apply to your financial aid offer. Those again will all go to your email students, not to your parents. So you are responsible for keeping up on this information. Skip, now, yes, ma'am. Can I ask for a Paul just quickly? We had a break in our Zoom. Did anybody else? Um, Dory, will you confirm with me? <clears throat> yes, it was right after you started talking about the email. Uh, the necessity to check emails, Skip. We lost you there. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. I really You'll appreciate it. Absolutely. Also, keeping in mind that we have interpreters on, so um, uh, you're good on time, Skip. <laughs> Absolutely. I will uh, be cognizant of that and moving as quickly and speaking as uh, smoothly as possible. All right. So, so um, financial aid award notice. You're gonna get email students. Uh, the student email is important in this process. You're going to have to check your email regularly because colleges will contact you with any disclaimers about the aid you're offered, any a reminder to report any outside scholarships that you receive, an itemized list of aid awarded, a list of action steps you must take to complete the process, and lastly, you'll also get some terms and conditions associated with your financial aid offer. So students, again, it's really important that you start checking your email regularly because this is how universities and community colleges will communicate with you in the future. Now this slide's very, uh, it, it, it's a dense slide. I just wanna point out here that regardless of the type of college you're going to attend, your expected family contribution will remain the same. So you'll see in campus A, campus B, and campus C, your EFC is $5,000. That won't change regardless of the cost of the university or community college. What may change is the way the university or college offers scholarships from the institutional level. If a college perhaps really wants you on their campus, they may offer you a financial aid opportunity that others don't. In this example, the third campus, Campus C, uh, had the highest sticker price, but when the financial aid offer came across the student's desk, it was actually the cheapest school. So students, 
don't write off any private universities at this point. Oftentimes, private colleges and universities have more flexibility in how they offer institutional scholarships. Now there's this process that happens primarily to families that don't use that IRS data retrieval tool. It's called verification. And verification is when either the college or the federal government goes over the family's FAFSA to make sure everything's accurate. If you use that IRS data retrieval tool that I alluded to a few slides ago, you'll be much less likely to be verified. If, however, you're verified, you'll have to provide your online tax transcript or perhaps a paper copy by mail. Again, I recommend families use that IRS data retrieval tool to avoid the FAFSA verification process because this is just a few more extra minutes that you don't need to spend on the financial aid process if you can avoid it. Now, I work for College Foundation in North Carolina. At CFNC, we have a bunch of tools that are designed to help students start the college going process. But what I'd like to point to tonight is our financial literacy course. I would like students to consider gaining some financial understanding before attending a university or community college. I say that because the financial world is very complex. We have a free tool on CFNC that you can utilize and you may be eligible after completing the process uh, for a $500 scholarship. So what we've talked about tonight include the free application for federal student aid. That again opens in October and I encourage families to complete it as soon as possible. We're gonna talk further about local scholarships as this presentation continues, but I want to mention that local scholarships often have the smallest applicant pools, which means that students are more eligible often for local opportunities. Not only can you find scholarships from uh, the organizations that we'll talk to tonight, but also prime, possibly through your church or your employer or through civic organizations. So students think outside of the box about the local scholarship process, it will benefit you in the long run. I've talked a little bit about institutional scholarships as well. Those are scholarships that come from the college itself and all colleges have different deadlines associated with their scholarships. So students, if you haven't started researching the colleges you want to attend, I encourage you to do so soon so you can identify how and when those scholarships are awarded. State-based scholarships oftentimes are promoted through cfnc.org and the pay for college tab. So please utilize those resources. And then I've also put some national scholarship uh, search engines below. These are the five that I prefer. I would like to caution students that these organizations have very competitive scholarships. So please use these after researching local, institutional, and statewide scholarships. Now, if you have any questions, my email is in the chat. I'll also be hanging out throughout this presentation to answer additional questions. You can also call CFNC at our 866-866-CFNC toll-free number, or you can visit CFNC for answers as well. Thank you very much, Tia, for your time. I'm gonna turn it back over to you and stop my share. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Skip. Um, I gleaned a lot from that. Um, and I hope you all have as well. And if, again, if you um, have any questions for Skip that he has not addressed that you don't want to address here, we have his email in the chat and you can um, send him your questions directly. Um, we do have, we have allotted 10 minutes um, for Q&A for Skip. So if you have any questions, you can either put it in the chat box and we will read it out loud and then Skip will answer. Or um, you can also go to reactions, which is a button at the bottom right, and you can raise your hand. Okay, just see. 
so in case folks are typing in questions, um, well, I see one, Jessica Gaspar. Yes. Okay, that's a great question. I have uh, one child in college. Do I need to fly? Do I need another FSA ID? No, you will use the FSA ID that you're using for your child currently in school. That is a great question. Thank you so much. Will institutional scholarships require information in addition to the FAFSA? Almost certainly. They're going to require potentially an application and maybe an essay, but it depends uh, the university type. Some schools may be uh, different in the way they offer scholarships. I can't give you um, an overarching answer there, but oftentimes institutional scholarships require the completion of the FAFSA. Okay, any more um, questions for Skip? While more questions are coming in, um, I'd like to mention that some students may encounter a process called the CSS profile. There are six universities, to my knowledge, in North Carolina that require this process, again called the CSS profile. Those schools are University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, NC State, um, Davidson, Duke, Wake Forest, and Dory, I'm forgetting the other one. Can you help me out there? You know what? I'm sorry. I lost track of who you mentioned. Uh, well, you'll figure it out when you find uh, when you're prompted to complete CSS profile. Oh, Elon. Elon's the other school. Um, CSS profile is designed to give colleges a better idea of the family's finances. So it will require information like how much the family owns on their owes on their mortgage and how much the family owes on their credit cards and things like that. There is a fee associated with the CSS profile. So students, if you're attending one of those schools, just be aware that that might be in the future. Now I see a student that says, or see a question, excuse me, that says, will a student need to complete the FAFSA if planning to attend a technical college? Yes, I would strongly recommend that a student go ahead and complete the FAFSA. There may be some opportunities through that technical college that could be made available after completing the FAFSA. See a question, can you address what to do if a student or parent doesn't have a social security number? In that instance, I recommend the student go ahead and complete the FAFSA. The parent's gonna have to complete the FAFSA as well. And instead of putting their SSN, they're gonna have to input nine zeros to uh, complete the FAFSA. Unfortunately, oftentimes the students will not be eligible for federal or state-based aid, but there may be institutional or local opportunities that could be available by completing the FAFSA. All right. Another question, any student wishing to receive federal financial aid at an institution? Will, okay, Dory, great response. Um, how do you get the FSA ID? Uh, you get the FSA ID by going to fsaid.ed.gov or perhaps by going to studentaid.gov. They're the same entity. Um, at that point, you'll need to take 10 minutes to complete the questionnaire associated with that FSA ID to get your uh, electronic signature. Where is the best place to locate and research local scholarship opportunities? Well, we've got some experts on hand to detail the opportunities available through the Burke Community Foundation and other organizations here in the future. You may also uh, want to talk with your priest or your pastor or a mom or rabbi about scholarships through your faith-based organization and also your employer. You might also want to check through the uh, civic organizations in your area. Those could include the Ruritan, the Moose, the Elk, all of those different civic organizations possibly have scholarships. Another question, is there a difference when making a student ID and a parent ID? How does it link together? There is no difference between the parent or student FSA ID process. You'll start the process and have to create some secret questions and uh, they don't actually link together. They will be linked together when used as electronic signatures in order to complete the FAFSA. That's a great question. Um, what if you have, yep. yes. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, um, 
cut right there. I just I do want to address the question regarding the best place to locate and research local scholarship opportunities. That is more information that we will be giving to you all as we've been um, working hard behind the scenes to kind of centralize all of that. And we will give you a lot of that information um, towards the end of the program. Awesome, thank you, Tia. Uh, if you have a 529 plan, that can potentially affect the need on the FAFSA. But there's recently been some legislation that was revised earlier this week that may benefit families that have saved through a 529. And at any rate, I think you should be commended for saving through a 529 plan. It will benefit your student in the very, in the very near future. Most of the high schooling departments have links to updated scholarship information. Yes, that's from my friend and colleague, Amanda Peck at East Burke. They do a wonderful job across the county of posting local scholarship information in the school counselor section of each individual school website. I should have mentioned that earlier. Thank you, Amanda, for pointing that out. And Skip, for those who may not know what a 529 plan is, can you just briefly touch on that? Yes, thank you, Tia. A 529 is a college savings plan. Every state has a 529 plan as directed by the IRS. It's a way that families in North Carolina can save for college with a lot of tax advantages. If you're interested in researching college savings plans, you can go to cfnc.org forward slash NC529. If a parent has a child that pre previously went through college and had an FSA ID, would they be able to use the same ID for the student who is entering college now? No, each individual student will have a unique FSA ID, but the parent will use the same FSA ID for both students. Dory's beat me to the answers. <laughs> Well, I think we both interpreted that question a little differently, um, so I hope it makes sense to people, but a parent's FSA ID will always remain the same, and yes. that parent will use that ID for each and every child they do a fast before, but each child will have their own unique FSA ID. Yes. Thank you, Dory. Any more questions for Skip? Feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hands. Skip, before, I don't see any more. So before we close out on your section of the event, um, I remember way back in the day when I was getting ready to fill out the FAFSA, I was a procrastinator. So <laughs> can you give us the, <laughs> you're raising your hand on that one too? Yes. Can you explain the scenario between somebody who applies for the FAFSA as soon as it opens, October 1, early versus somebody who maybe waits till 2022, kind of procrastinates, the difference in the eight, uh, particularly around grants, the difference That's that they will be receiving in those packages. Great question, Tia. So if a family assumes that Skip Watts is crazy and he really needs a haircut, so we're gonna procrastinate and do our FAFSA in April of 2022, as opposed to October of 2021. They can complete the FAFSA. However, they may not receive the same eligibility for state and institutional grants. The money is first come first serve, especially at the state and institutional level. So let's think of it this way, Tia. Every time a student is admitted to a college and their financial aid package is awarded, there's that much less aid available for the next student. So if we wait too long to complete the financial aid process, starting with the FAFSA form, we may wait our way out of some eligibility, potentially at the state, institutional, and maybe even at the federal level. Great question. So don't procrastinate. 
And I will also add in there that sometimes for some of these scholarships or grants, you have to complete the FAFSA. So even if, even if you're applying for scholarships, that would sometimes is a requirement. So Absolutely. before we sign off for Skip, I do, I'm going back through the questions. I, I wanna make sure we have addressed all of them. Did we answer the one that said, will a student need to complete FAFSA if planning to attend technical college? We answered that recommend yes. Um, there are still financial aid opportunities at technical colleges, so I would recommend completing the FAFSA so as not to leave that money on the table. Okay. So one last question. When is Patton High School going to allow students to complete the FAFSA at school? I know in the past they've taken a day to let seniors do that. So if we have any counselors or um, Perhaps Jamie, anybody who can speak on behalf of Patton High School? Amy Shuping, can you answer that question? Uh, We're planning a college application week. I think somebody else is speaking too, but we're planning a college application week, October the 18th. But I think they're doing some, they're going to be helping with FAFSA also. Uh, Gear Up will be, and they're going to, I think, be making appointments. So, yes. I'm sorry. I got an email from Hannah Scruggs that indicated that Patton was going to do a FAFSA assistance day on October the 19th between 11 and 5, and they would allow families to sign up. And jumping into our next section we will be talking about follow-up lab sessions and how you can get one-on-one -on -one appointment. Um, I do see one last question here so um, this will be the last one for Skip's session and if you have questions for him that um, you didn't get a chance to answer you can also email him. We will drop his email link in the chat for you. Um, Skip, if my child verbally committed to a college already and is getting a soccer scholarship, should we do FAFSA before applying? Yes, absolutely. Um, oftentimes coaches are gonna request that, that be complete, completed before they can complete their offer to the student. So yeah, go ahead and complete that FAFSA as early as possible. And congratulations to the student for uh, their commitment to soccer. Yeah, that's my favorite sport when I, I was in high school. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Skip. Um, thank you for your wonderful finance, um, your advice, um, for your participation, your collaboration every year, coming on here, helping us guide students. It's these past years have been really difficult. So um, thank you and feel free to reach out to Skip. Um, he's very passionate about helping our students. Um, so our next session, we're going to talk about follow-up lab sessions um, and where you can get appointments to get one-on-one -on -one help. Um, so I will turn it over to Kim Logan and Darian Evans with Burke Gear Up. So thanks, Tia, appreciate it. And thank you, Skip, for doing a fabulous job on explaining the FAFSA process. Um, we gear up, just want to let families know that we are available to assist with completing the FAFSA. Um, we will not be able to hold in-person events like we did a couple of years ago where families get together with their students and we bring you in in the evening at each one of our high schools and help you um, due to COVID but we will be able to do it virtually again this year. And so we are working on dates um, in October, November, and any other time after that, that we um, can schedule with families virtually to complete the FAFSA. Um, we're blessed to have Skip on board to help us with that and Dory and her Western Piedmont Community College uh, financial aid team to help us with that. And so we tried it last year for the first time. It worked pretty well. Um, you will have privacy. We meet at a certain time and then we have breakout rooms and you're able to work individually 
with a person to help you with your financial aid, um, completing your financial aid form, the FAFSA. So we are working on dates to do that. And so what we would like for you to do today is um, Tia or Aaron are gonna put in the chat box um, a link to our Google form. And we would love for you to fill that out, submit it, and we'll have your name, your student's name, um, phone numbers, and we're going to be reaching back out to you to schedule um, a date and some times for you to complete it with us. So, and we'll also include in that information what you'll need to have on hand to make the process smoother. As Tip, um, Skip said, the number one one thing we'd love for you to do ahead of time is complete that FSA ID. So that's already ready. Have that for yourself and your student, parent and the student FSA ID. And that helps the process go a whole lot smoother and quicker. And so if you do need help, click on that link, fill out that form, submit it to us, and we'll be in touch. But that won't be the only time. I mean, there'll be other opportunities. And if, for those who may not have been on tonight, we are available, Darion and I, um, at the high schools. So email us, let us know if you need help with your FAFSA completion. We will work around to work with you one-on-one -on -one at school, but we wanted to open up some opportunities in the evenings for you and your family to complete the form. So email us, let us know um, if you need help. I think they put our email addresses in there as well and the Google link and let us know. At Freedom High School, we have a college advisor there. Her name is Allison Montgomery. She's available all day for seniors to um, take appointments or make appointments to get their FAFSA completed. So we reach out to Allison as well. So we've got Darion and I, we've got CFNC, Western Piedmont. Um, you can also go to the CFNC website. I just checked it out today. There's great step-by-step -step process that if you wanna try to figure it out yourself, um, it's there. So look forward to helping you. Just click on that Google form and we'll be in touch. Thank you, Kim. I would also like to mention if you are um, joining us and you are listening to this presentation in Spanish and you need help in Spanish, we are also connected to CFNC's Dr. Juanes Ramirez. He is the Spanish, Spanish Services Manager for CFNC. And so um, he can be reached at juanes.ramirez.cfi.org. Aaron will put that in the chat as well. Um, and you can reach out to him to have one-on-one -on -one sessions in Spanish to help you um, navigate the FAFSA. Additionally, when if you registered for this event through our Google form, we had an indicator at the bottom. If you want Spanish sessions, we have your information and we will be contacting Dr. Juanes Ramirez on your behalf as well for these one-on-one -on -one sessions in Spanish. So thank you, Kim and Darian for coming on here. Thank you. Our work doesn't stop with this event. There's a lot of follow-up um, and we will be helping and assisting Gear Up as well. This is informational and then Gear Up helps you get the that dense FAFSA done. Um, moving on, we will be hearing from three organizations that provide scholarships. And then after that, we will talk about the information you're going to receive regarding how we've compiled all of these um, scholarships together, together. So you're not, you don't have 20 browsers open looking for scholarships. You can just have one document and you can access it there. So thank you again, Kim and Darian, and be on the lookout, um, have your student check their student emails. If you registered for this session, we will also send it through the email that um, you registered with. And additionally, you can also keep an eye on our Facebook, our social media, that's just work in Burke or gear up or go on to Burke County Public Schools website or social media, we will have all of this information out. So moving on to our next session and our first presenter, um, I would like to welcome Dory Barron with Western Piedmont Community College. I am also a Western Piedmont Community College graduate. Um, she is the Director of Financial Aid um, and she will speak to you a little bit about the scholarships they have available and you will also have time for a little bit of Q&A with her. Dory? Thank you, Tia, very much. 
Um, welcome all of our Burke County families and students. I'm glad to have you here. Um, I'm going to take just a brief moment to talk a little bit about the um, scholarship opportunities that are available to students who may choose to attend Western Piedmont Community College that are offered through the Western Piedmont Foundation. Um, there are basically two separate scholarship applications. Uh, one is a general scholarship application, um, and that is a one-page form um, that allows a student to be considered for up to 100 to 110 different scholarships that are offered through our foundation. So that one application um, will allow us to do that for the student. Uh, it's a need-based scholarship application, so it does require that the student have completed the FAFSA. Um, other than that, it also asks that the student complete a one-page essay. And on the scholarship form itself, it does contain three or four prompts that will help the student compose their narrative for the essay, but it's just a one page requirement. The second scholarship is a merit based scholarship and as Skip mentioned earlier in his presentation, this one is not based on need, but it's based on academic merit, community service, leadership involvement, and, and maybe a special talent. Um, it does require that a student have a minimum 2.5 GPA. Um, but it does not require that the student complete a FAFSA. It does also require a one page essay. And again, there are some prompts there that will direct the student to help form their narrative for that one page essay. And it also does require a recommendation from an outside source who knows the applicant well and will be willing to write a recommendation. Both of those scholarship applications are made available to students and the public from February through June 1st of each year. Our deadline for those applications is always June 1st. And it's also, by the way, our priority deadline for the FAFSA when a student completes that. Um, we do occasionally accept scholarship applications that come in last at, at past that date, um, but they're considered on the second go round and a lot of the aid has already been dispersed as Skip mentioned. So it's critical to pay attention to those early deadlines um, at each school. Um, we also offer additional information from a, a few other scholarships on our webpage, and I'm going to put our webpage address in the uh, chat box here in a moment when I get done. In addition to an occasional scholarship offering from an outside entity, we also have a guide for DACA and or undoc undocumented students that we keep on our webpage year round. So I'd highly recommend families that uh, need the access to that type of information check it out. Uh, regardless of what you think about your eligibility for aid, I'm going to put another plug in for doing that FAFSA. That FAFSA is what we call a gateway application. And as I mentioned, our scholarships require that you do it. Um, you need to do that FAFSA to be considered for state aid programs. And particularly in this year with the COVID pandemic, the federal government made a tremendous amount of money available to institutions and colleges across this, the country to assist students with these emergency expenses as a result of the pandemic. And quite frankly, they wanted us to target students with the highest need. And the way we did that was by the results of the FAFSA. Um, doesn't mean that students who didn't do a FAFSA didn't get money, but they got much less. So you definitely want to do that application, no matter what you think your eligibility is going to be. Lastly, I do want to make a plug for um, our assistance. The financial aid office here, our counselors at Western Piedmont, will assist anyone, regardless of whether you're attending Western Piedmont Community College, with any questions you may have about the FAFSA or how to apply. Um, we are providing assistance via phone and through email. And as Kim Logan mentioned a minute ago, we are going to be working with some virtual sessions throughout the remainder of the year to provide some one-on-one -on -one assistance. So um, I'll put our phone number in the chat, our scholarship webpage in the chat, um, and our financial aid email address in the chat. Um, and before I go, does anyone have any questions for me specifically? And it's okay if you don't. <laughs> okay. I do want to say, Dory, that, um, and I, I want parents and students on this call to keep in mind, um, she said one really, really important thing. I mean, it was all, great, but she said, 
you can get financial aid help. I mean, you can get help with the FAFSA, applying for the FAFSA um, without having intentions of going to Western Piedmont. Absolutely. Um, and so you have Western Piedmont, you have your counselors at Burke County Public Schools, you have Gear Up. There are a lot of folks here that want to make sure the FAFSA is completed um, and that we're all here to help you all. Um, and so whether you're more comfortable on Western Piedmont's campus or working with the school counselors at Burke County Public Schools or attending one of the gear up sessions, just know that we're here to make sure um, you get through this process as painlessly as possible. Thank you so much, Dory. Our next presenter is the wonderful Nancy Taylor, who is the Director of Community Foundation of Burke County. Nancy, welcome, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, Tia, for having me. Um, we are the Community Foundation located right here in Morganton, but we serve all of Burke County. And I want to echo what Skip said is that an advantage to your local scholarships is you compete only in the county. Our scholarships are only for uh, Burke County students. The, in the past year, last year, we offered 50 scholarships for um, 2021 to 2022. This year, there'll be three. We've added three more scholarships for there are 53 scholarships to offer. Uh, the new scholarships that have come on are two for financial aid and one for Patton High School specifically. They're merit-based that we ask what we have. Our scholarships are merit-based, they're need-based, they are noted for specific schools, they are based on specific um, majors. And what we have is a universal application. You simply have to go to our website, www.cfburkcounty.org and you will see our website and click on scholarships. You fill out the universal application and that will filter for you. Um, you'll need certain documents that you should have ready to go. FAFSA is number one, you will need that. Please do that. Um, and when we ask you to upload that, we need the full document. We've put a video on there to show you how to do that. Um, but we need the full document, not the first page. Um, you'll be asked to put a transcript up, uh, upload a transcript. You'll be asked to also upload a little sheet on your community activity and your, um, Scott, your activities in school. And then you'll be asked to have two recommendations, one from a community member and one from a teacher, counselor, or someone in your school system. Those two recommendations have to be from different people. And if you've also received some awards, you also would um, upload that information there. You do this once when, and you'll, be, you'll receive a dashboard just like you do when you apply for your, for your college applications. It's the same thing, you'll have a, da uh, a dashboard. You'll need to go check that periodically. Like most, uh, like Skip was also saying, our scholarships are a combination. They're from individual donors have established them. They have uh, been established by civic groups like the Morganton Rotary Club, the Valdez Rotary Club, the Valdez Lions Club. Um, different churches have established with us. So um, when you go in there, you can look at the different options. You will see the different options, but you don't have to apply for them individually. It'll filter for you. You simply fill out the universal application. Not all of our scholarship um, applications require an essay, some do. So once you've completed the universal application and you see what you qualify for, it will come back and tell you if you need to upload an essay. Perfect example would be a Rotary Club. They will ask you to do an essay on their, their motto of service above self. So you'll see that. Um, there's a limited space to do it. These are not long essays. And I would imagine, as I say to some of the students, you can copy and paste some of what you've had when you've done your college application. So please take note of that. Um, I think the other thing I would say is that the, the scholarships range from $750 to $4,500. Um, anyone who applies is 
eligible for all the scholarships they apply for. So if you if you receive if you're awarded one, does not mean you cannot be awarded two. You can. Um, we've had um, those industrious students that apply and have gotten anywhere from you know one to seven scholarships because they they applied and they did the work. Um, I would say that um, the other thing I I would um, also mention is that. Um, when someone asks, what are the other resources, please call me. Just call me and I'll let you know in town what they are. I can tell you right now, cfwnc.org, which is the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina. They are, uh, you need to go on there. They have uh, a few opportunities. They serve 19 counties, but there are a few for Burke County. And I believe their due date is Jan end of January. Please apply to them first. We start, we'll upload our scholarship data December 1. You can start applying December 1. We, we will close March 1st, but you need to go to the cfwnc.org first. Um, another local one is huffmancornwell.org. They, they're, I believe they're up right now. Um, and you would just click on theirs. And that's a much simpler process through theirs too. So um, I'd encourage you to look at those, but please, you can call me. You can email me. Um, that's our job from now, from December 1 through March 1st. This is all we do, scholarships. And I would say I'm really proud of our community because um, it's amazing how many private donors have stepped up to make sure our kids have the opportunity for a higher education. And, and even if you are interested in a two-year college, a four-year college, trades, we have some scholarships for that. So please, you know, take the time to do it. And if you question whether you're eligible, just give me a call and I'll, I'll walk through that with you. And we are here to help you. Typically I'm in the school system. I have to thank all these great counselors out there that have always been so gracious to me when I come in the school system and help me out. Um, and I certainly have missed doing that in the last couple of years, um, but I'm here to help and anyone can call and um, we are glad to help from this end. Thank you, Tia. Thank you so much, Nancy. Does anyone have questions for Nancy? You can either raise your hands or you can put it in the chat box. I don't see any. Okay, uh, Becky George, if you will unmute yourself. Yeah, what was the, the second website after CFW or CFWNC.org? Huffmancornwell.org, H-U-F-M-N-A-N, Cornwell, C-O-R-N-W-E-L-L. -L. Just com. Google that and you'll find it. It'll come right up. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. So all of these um, scholarship providers that Nancy mentioned will be a part of the um, document that we will be sending out to you all that have registered for this session and also to Burke County Public School seniors. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards the end there. Um, we have a question, where and how will this recording be available? So we will um, get this recording from the lovely Jamie Norton and we will um, send it out either through our social or through the students, um, the seniors student emails. We will also send it out to those who have registered for this session. Um, for us, this, this is not an exclusive thing where the only way you get this information is if you attend, we understand people's schedules are different. Um, we understand we may not have the preferred language on here if it's not English or Spanish, if it's something else, but we will make it available publicly through all of our social media and through um, the school's um, email out to the students and to the parents that have registered here for this session. Yes, we can have it posted on the Burke County Public School website for parents. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Our next and last presenter um, is Laura Malo with the, she is the program coordinator for the NC Works Career Center. Laura, I'll let you take it. 
Hi, thank you for having me. Um, well, I want to start out with our scholarship program is a little bit different than a lot of the other ones. Uh, we do not have any requirements for ours for any kind of type of essay. Um, it is a federally funded program, but we don't have like deadline dates or anything like that. Our main thing is that it needs to be uh, applying probably about a month to two months before your class that you want to take starts. Um, we can fund things that are in demand careers and we can do certificate programs. We can do diploma programs up to associate degree programs. Um, the things that we can pay for are tuition, books, fees, tools of the trade. Um, and if you don't know what tools of the trade are, it'd be example would be a nursing student who needs scrubs and stethoscope and um, nursing shoes and different things like that. We can assist with the costs of those items. Um, also, if they are if they qualify for our program, we also have options for childcare assistance. And uh, depending on the age range, they may even qualify uh, for gas cards to help with the transportation, getting back and forth to school, or if they have internship or clinical hours, it can assist with that. Um, with our stuff, you do need to complete the FAFSA as with most of these other ones. Uh, but we don't have, um, as I said, the, we don't have the requirements of an essay. There is an application process and some general documentation that is needed, but this is open to anybody at pretty much any time. And it's not just youth, it is adults as well that we can help fund. Also with being part of NC Works, there's other services that are available through the center there. Most people don't know what NC Works is. NC Works Career Center is most often referred to as the unemployment office. So if you know where that is on East Union Street, that's where we're located. But we can also help with things like resumes. We can help, we have computers that people can utilize for job applications, for if they need access to fill out scholarship applications, if they need access for uh, applying to colleges, doing homework, we've got all this that's available through our centers. And also another, another branch of our program is we do have a work experience program that can help the students who maybe don't have, they're looking to go into a certain field, but they're not sure if they would like it. And we can get them placed in a, in a job where they can try it out, see if they like it before they go through all the training, or if they've already, they're going through the training and they're nearing the end and wanna get the experience piece we also can assist with that. So I'm going, that's pretty much the end of this. I'm going to go ahead and put up contact information. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. If you have any questions for Laura, you can either put your hands up or you can put it in the chat. Becky, is, did your hand just stay up from the previous question or do you have your hands up again? I can't tell. <laughs> Sorry, it's still up. Let me turn it off, hold on. I, I'm new to this. Okay, there we go, Sorry. <laughs> While you're on here, do you have a question for Laura? <laughs> no, I think we're good right now. Thank you so much to all of our scholarship presenters. Everything they've mentioned, um, and this is the last part of this um, event, is everything they've mentioned will be in our document. So we've been working with the school systems to compile one document that will have links to all of these, as many scholarships as we can find, um, whether it's community foundation, um, NC Works, uh, Western Piedmont, and Huffman Cornwall, everybody will be on this one document. We will email this document out to high school seniors emails. 
and again to the emails that you use to register for this session. You will have this one document so you can just have it all in one place, click the different links that you want to visit. Um, if you have any questions about any of the scholarships that are on this document, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to me. Um, my email is tia, T-E-A, at workinburk.com. It will be in the chat. Um, and if I can't answer them for you, I will make sure you are connected to somebody who can answer those questions. Additionally, if you have FAFSA questions and you can't remember who else to contact from this call, you can also contact me um, through my email and I will connect you to uh, the appropriate financial aid technician, whoever it is that um, you need, whether it's Skip, someone at the college, or you need Dr. Juanes Ramirez, um, we will make sure that that happens. Now, when you get this scholarship document, be mindful of the dates that these scholarships open. Be mindful when they are due. Um, we want to do everything we can um, to help our students get these scholarships, to make sure you're aware that there is a lot of money out in our community to help our students, but we can't apply for you. We can't apply for the students. Um, and so we really encourage you to take a look at those um, deadlines. Um, going back to what Dory said about their scholarships where it opens in February and it closes June 1st. So just keeping an eye um, on the due dates. However, if you are struggling with um, filling out the applications or these scholarships or you don't know what kind of references you need, please reach out to us and we will help you as well. We're here to make sure your children um, get the necessary financial funding that they need to continue their education. And I feel really good because I feel like we're gonna jump off early, <laughs> 15 minutes early, just about. Um, do we have any additional questions for anybody? I think Becky's got. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So I'm, I'm her husband. I, I jumped in kind of middle ways of this and I missed the first part of it. But my question is, what uh, what's the best resource for scholarships outside of the community? And you may have went over this earlier on. I just didn't hear it. So I was just curious if you could kind of just give me a brief synopsis of best resources for external scholarships that are not in the community. Outside of the community. Nancy, can I throw that one to you? You mentioned the um, Western NC resource. Yeah, I, th I think he's, I think he's, are you asking, I gave you those two local ones, cfwnc.org and Huffman Cornwell. Are you asking more specifically about the broader ones in the state of North Carolina, things like that? Correct. Yeah, so Skip might be, be the best one for that. Thanks, Nancy, I appreciate that. Yeah, um, I'd recommend cfnc.org, first of all. Um, that's where you're going to find all the state administered scholarships and a variety of other opportunities. I'd also recommend students start looking for scholarships at the institutional level. Those are scholarships that come from the college itself. And uh, I think that's a really good starting point or jumping off point for tonight's discussion. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any more questions? All right, well, please keep an eye out on your emails and ask your seniors to also keep an eye out on the, their student emails. Like I said earlier, this doesn't end with this event. This event here is very much an informational session. There's a lot of follow-up work to do on your part and on our part, and we're willing to walk um, along you, alongside you through this journey. Um, Gear Up will be reaching out. They have their Google form for lab sessions. We will be sending this recorded Zoom call out. We will be sending out the scholarship document. Um, and if you have any, any questions for Skip, for me, for anybody, any of these presenters on this call, 
please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, we're more than happy um, to help you. And with, with that, I would like to thank, um, there's just so many people that works together to make sure this happens. Um, Burke County Public Schools, just we could not, we can't do this work without you. Um, College Foundation of North Carolina, Gear Up. Um, Western, Western Piedmont. Piedmont. <laughs> Western Piedmont, um, everybody that was on this call presenting um, about scholarships, Nancy, Dory, and Laura, thank you so much. Thank you to our support team. Thank you to Sinsotle Language Justice Cooperative um, for being on this call, making sure that this, uh, a uh, this event is bilingual and accessible to everyone. And then thank you to the parents and the students um, who attended this session. Please reach out to us. We are here to help you. And so with that, I will sign off. So thank Tia, you. Can I, can I jump in for just a second, Tia? Yes. Everybody, don't forget to use your school counselor as a resource as well. Mm -hmm. They're a wonderful point of information. So uh, thank you, Tia, for everything you did. I don't mean to interject, but I uh, just wanted to put that out there. Thank you all. Have a lovely evening. Stay safe.